you know, I come before you with all of this stuff unfinished. This is not a teaching or a system or an anything. It's an eyewitness account of a hyperdimensional automobile accident or something. We're not saying what the conclusions are. We don't know what the conclusions are, but this is big news. And when I first encountered this kind of stuff, I was, uh, I was uh, a young art historian at the University of California, and I assumed that any motif, no matter how outre or bizarre, you would be able to look at the painting, folklore, and sculpture of somebody on this planet and find uh, a, a trace. And it, didn't, it seemed as though this defeated that idea. It was almost counter the idea of the collective unconscious because it argued that you, Joe, anybody, Sally, somebody, can break through on your own, an ordinary person, to a place that Verrucchio never saw, Michelangelo didn't anticipate it, Yeats didn't know, Blake hadn't a clue, Melville wasn't briefed, and yet there it is, you know? And this is, uh, uh, to me as an intellectual, it was very confusing, because I think as intellectuals we always assume that progress will be built on the, on the shoulders of the giants that have preceded us. The idea of something actually 100% brand new and unexpected is pretty daunting. And, and here, it, here it was, 30 seconds away, uh, uh, simply by the act of ingesting this natural neurotransmitter. Well, those of you who've been there know exactly what I'm talking about. Those of you who haven't been there, I can't imagine how you can even sit through this kind of thing because, you know, it makes the folks from the Pleiades and all that other stuff out there seem mundane by comparison. The other thing is we're not talking about camping out in cornfields night after freezing night with your eyes glued to the stars in wan hope. This is a no-fail method for plunging deeper into these spiritual uh, realms than the tantric yogas or the practitioners of X, Y, or Z dare scarcely suppose. It's repeatable. It's on demand. It does not depend upon your state of moral purity or, uh, you know, tantric accomplishment. It's something that is our birthright as much as our sexuality, our language, our eyesight, our appreciation of music. It's uh, an innate human thing. And, uh, you know, to try and return to the premises of your question, I tried to formulate theories about what could this be. Well, the first impression that I had, based on a reading of how weird this all was, was this must be a, a parallel continuum, a la Philip K. Dick and like that, that just apparently over some kind of neurological energy barrier that's all around us all the time, these things are there and they are not made of matter, so the laws of physics don't apply and, you know, like that. And then and then I entertained different possibilities, and I still entertain numerous possibilities because I haven't got it figured out yet. One possibility is that these things are actually human beings from the future. I mean, if you take the content of the experience seriously and say, I am apparently in contact with diminutive English-speaking creatures of some sort, well then, they have got to be either intelligent beings from another part of the universe or humans from uh, some extraordinarily advanced future world where human beings are now made of language and are only two and a half feet tall so I would put it rather far in the future or and I just simply offer this in the spirit of, uh, of intellectual completeness uh, if you ask a shaman or, a sh or uh, what these things are, they don't hesitate. They just say, oh, well, those are the ancestor spirits. Uh, this is what it's all about, is ancestor spirits. Well, it takes a while for the implications of this to sink in. They're talking about dead people. 
that's what an ancestor spirit is. They're suggesting that the dearly departed do not evanesce into sunlight or something cheerfully non-specific like that, but that this actually is uh, simply one level of a cosmic system of some sort where birth and death are transitions from level to level. Well, this is just exactly the kind of thing that I'm intellectually set up to doubt and to feel a kind of scorn for. Because, you know, people have been running around since time immemorial claiming this sort of thing with an incredibly underwhelming body of evidence to back them up. And yet, if you try to approach the problem scientifically, I think you would agree that in terms of likelihood, although operating in this realm, what this means, I'm not sure, but that in terms of likelihood, it's more likely that these are human souls in another dimension than that we are being contacted by friendly extraterrestrials, or even that we share the Earth with an invisible race of syntactical uh, tribal elf uh, legions of some sort. But I think this conclusion is the one that we would tend to resist most strenuously. I mean, you e e very, I think it's the most intellectually challenging position to take vis-a-vis -vis Western thinking to claim that we have to reopen the question of life after death in a serious way, not the cheerful round of reincarnation that haunts uh, some of the zanier offshoots of Eastern religion, but actually say, you know, you are going to die, and when you die, you know, you are going to undergo a metamorphosis of some sort that is not particularly going to be designed to preserve your humanness, what you call your humanness, or to set you on a cloud with lyre and gown for the rest of eternity, but that Actually, uh, the greatest adventure, the greatest adventures still lie ahead. And uh, these things, uh, intimations of immortality, are vouchsafed by these plant hallucinogens. Why this should be, why it should be possible to get a, bring, a look over the Great Divide, I have no idea. I think about these things constantly. My life is mostly questions. Uh, my friend Rupert Sheldrake, who some of you may know his books, he and I have talked about it. He thinks that uh, that, that, that there is a chemistry of dying, that in the same way that there is a chemistry of giving birth, there is a chemistry of dying, and that DMT parallels and anticipates this. He calls it uh, not a hallucinogen but a necroptic substance. It actually show, anticipates the death state itself. I once had the fortunate opportunity of being able to turn a, a very prominent Tibetan Lama onto DMT, a name that you would recognize, although not one of the top five, but a more wizened, older, stranger character. And I, you know, he did it, and I said, so what about it? You know, these people, these Tibetan Buddhists, they have a pretty good map of the territory. He said, it's the lesser lights. He said, you can't go further than that without breaking the thread of return. He said, you know, beyond this, there's no returning. And so, you know, in a very real sense, it's a look over the edge. But then, you know, even that doesn't solve all the mysteries. I mean, what is it about this wish to convey a language which is seen, what's that all about? Is it that perhaps language has always been a gift from the other? We don't, it's a little hard to picture how the kind of language I'm using right now ever got started. Uh, I mean, notice that language is a behavior it's a behavior, that's all it is. It's something, it's a complex activity having to do with small mouth noises and the neurological processing of same. Uh, we must have been essentially as we are 
before language. It's like breakdancing or something like that. Um, you're fully set up to do it, and people have been for millennia. But until somebody actually does it, it only exists as a formal possibility in the organism. And I wonder how many of these things uh, there are. I mean, breakdancing is an interesting example, albeit somewhat trivial. But it shows that after five, six, seven thousand years of civilization, you can come up with a behavior that nobody has ever seen uh, before. I've I've spent a lot of time thinking about language and how what a limited tool it is, and yet how our whole world is held together by nothing more than small mouth noises. And it, it's incredible. The entirety of global civilization is held together by small mouth noises and symbolic notations of same, which have an even more rarefied level of abstraction. Our separateness, our notion of self and world, of self and species, all rest on the carrying capacity of these small mouth noises. One of the things that has interested me, some of you have heard me talk about this, is, you know, I think good psychedelic trips inspire a lot of homework, which usually means reading in curious areas. And I discovered that um, octopi, cephalopods, which in case you're not up on your evolutionary biology, these are uh, mollusca. They're not even vertebrates. They're related to escargot and banana slugs. I mean, you can hardly imagine a form of life more alien to ourselves. I mean, you know, we broke off from the other primates three million years ago, but the invertebrates and the vertebrates separated from each other about 700 million years ago. Well. Uh, an interesting thing going on with octopi, most people have heard that they can change color. And most people, I think, assume this means that like certain lizards and certain butterflies, they camouflage themselves against their background. That's not what's going on. Color and texture for octopi are the um, medium of language. It's, you could almost say that an octopus is a naked mind because uh, as the octopus goes through certain internal changes, hunger, sexual need, whatever, uh, color changes accompany these in shifts of internal state and appear on the surface of the octopus. It is almost as though it wears its language like an overcoat. It is clothed in its own meaning. Well, obviously in that kind of situation you have always been suspended in an ambiance of language, unlike ourselves, where apparently language was invented one bright summer day, or series of bright summer days. and. If you have a language such as we have, small mouth noises with culturally assigned meaning. In other words, if I say, where can I get a taxi? If I don't say this to a person who speaks English, it means nothing to a Ukrainian or a Chinese. Octopi don't have this problem. There are not culturally localized languages. There's only a language of the body, the genes. It's unambiguous. You see, even those of us in this room, if you were to check, uh, our internal dictionaries are different. We have only the assumption of one-to-one -one mapping of meaning. I mean, if I ask you, uh, where is the restroom? This is fairly ambiguous, unambiguous, because it deals with ordinary situations. But as soon as, as, soon as conversation leaves the main and well-trodden path of discourse, ambiguity enters in to a tremendous degree. We overlook this as a courtesy to each other. I mean, you almost never hear one person say to another, now would you explain to me what I just said? 
The reason you don't hear this said very often is because the thin illusion of communication would break down completely uh, if we actually demanded of our listeners that they repeat back to us. The only situation in which that happens on a regular basis is the pedagogical mode where the teacher teaches and then by test and recitation determines that the pupil has understood. But in polite discourse among adults, uh, we consider this an imposition, if not an insult. So uh, somehow these creatures are elves of language, catalysts for the concrescence of cognition. And I don't know if these things can be understood. After all, we're embedded in the world created by our own meanings. Uh, C.D. Broad, I think it was C.D. Broad, wrote a book called The Meaning of Meaning. Or No, it was F.H. Bradley, actually. I think Broad's book was called The Mind and Its Place in Nature. Uh, probably these two should be read back to back just to see how positivists handle these kinds of problems. The meaning of meaning is a real problem, but it also tends to be solipsistic or tautological. Can we expect brain to give a full accounting of brain? Can we expect mind to give a full accounting of mind? Anybody who's studied logic for 10 minutes can tell you that that's impossible because it is tautological.